Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we are here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. And our guest this week is Cassie Holmes. She is the author of the new book, Happier Hour, which is a super fun title. And we're going to be talking about the uh, perennial and popular topic of how to be happier. So let's dig in and figure out some strategies so that we can improve your life today. Cassie Holmes, great to have you. Awesome. It's so fun to, to be here. <laughs> it's a treat. Thank you. That's great. And for those of you tuning in from around the world, please type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you are dialing in from. I am dialing in from today, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, thus the lion dog. So Cassie, your book, Happier Hour, it talks about an, an interesting concept um, you know, ev everybody knows about being financially poor, especially in the age of inflation, people are worried about not having enough money. But you talk about time poverty, which I think uh, a lot of us, a lot of us experience, but maybe haven't thought about it or formulated it in quite that way. How do we think about time poverty? And how, you know, what, what should we be doing? You know, what, what sort of cognitive shift is engendered when we think about being time poor? Yeah, and it's such an important question because time poverty is such a serious and important issue. So time poverty is that acute feeling of having too much to do and not enough time to do it. And it is prevalent. So we conducted a national poll that showed that nearly half of Americans feel time poor, though moms tend to feel more time poor than dads. And though working parents tend to feel particularly impoverished, all types of people lack for time. So you see folks without kids, even folks who aren't working, who feel like they're suffering from a hectic pace of life with too much to do and not enough time to do. And then it's not just us Americans. Time poverty is reported all over the world. And it's bad because our research shows the negative effects. So when we feel time poor, it makes us less healthy. So we're less likely to exercise. We delay going to the doctor. It makes us less nice. So we're less likely to slow down and help others. It makes us less confident in being able to achieve all that we set out to do. And it makes us less happy. And that, and actually a personal experience of feeling like I just had too much to do and not enough time to do it, and the unhappiness and the stress and the feelings of everyone from that is really actually the story that motivated this book of how do we invest the time that we have to feel happier so that at the end of the day, instead of looking back and feeling exhausted and overwhelmed and stressed out and unhappy, that you actually look back on the day and yes, you actually might be busy, but instead of it, it feeling just busy and stressful, it feels fulfilling and you feel satisfied and you're ready for the next day. And so that is what I look to um, address in Happier Hour based off of my research, as well as those of colleagues in the field to figure out how do we invest the hours that we have. A super important question. We're here with Cassie Holmes. She's a professor at UCLA. She's the author of the new book. It's called Happier Hour. We're talking about how we can be happier. And if you are enjoying this conversation, if you want your friends and colleagues to be happier, which let's hope you do, uh, hit the like and share button so that your friends can benefit from this conversation as well. And I want to say hi to some of the great friends who are tuning in to join us this week from around the world. We have a LinkedIn friend from California. Zulima is here again from Mexico. Adisak is here. Doreen's in Ohio. Uh, Iwana is here from Switzerland. Diana from South Carolina. Leon's uh, near, near me in Raleigh. Eileen's in Canada. Ludovic is in France. We've got a LinkedIn friend from Denver. We have uh, Lorena from Mexico. Minerva from Mexico. Good showing, Mexico. I like it. Mullins in Hamburg. Gurov is in India. Kate is in State College, Pennsylvania. And Sepeda is from London. We love having all of you guys here. Uh, Sarav is in India and Jeremy's in Worcester. Thanks for joining us. And please type your questions about how to be happier into the chat box and Cassie Holmes will help tackle them. Now, Cassie, a question that I have, one of the things that I thought was most fascinating about your book 
it, you know, we, I think we can get it intuitively. People are busy. We're racing around. We know that there's lots of people who don't have enough time or at least feel like they don't. The part that I thought was super interesting is that you are indicating that there's actually problems on both ends of the spectrum, that too much free time can actually be extremely deleterious. Can you talk about this and in, in your contention that there's sort of a sweet spot about the amount of free time that people should be having? Yeah, and that's super important. And it's a great question because as I just talked about that feeling of being time poor, one of, and I can absolutely relate, is one of the solutions. You're like, okay, if you are sort of trying to keep up with the pressures at work, maybe you're a parent trying to be a good parent, trying to be a good partner, trying to be a good friend, and then the never ending pile of chores. In those states, it's very likely that you're like, okay, the solution is clear. I should quit my job and then I'd have a whole lot more time and then I'd be happier, right? But before I decided I was going to quit my job in this sort of state of feeling um, like I didn't have enough time, I'm like, okay, this is an empirical question. Would our people who have a whole lot more time happier? And so with Hal Hirschfield and Marissa Sharif, some of my favorite collaborators, we look to test what is the relationship between the amount of discretionary time people have and their happiness and their satisfaction in life. And among our studies, in one of the studies, we analyzed data from the American Time Use Survey, which calculated for tens of thousands of working as well as non-working Americans, how they spent the hours of a regular day. And from that, we calculated how much time they spent on discretionary activities. So relaxing, watching TV, there's some sort of more active leisure like playing sports, going and watching sports, hanging out with family and friends. So we calculated and what we found, the results were surprising. So the results showed a inverted U shape, so an arc or a rainbow. So on the one hand, yes, those with too few hours of discretionary time in the day were unhappy. That's what we know. That's what I know. That's what we've talked about so far. But on the other hand, there's also this dip in happiness. So in this data set, those with more than approximately five hours of discretionary time were also unhappy. And digging into this, what it seems is that we are driven to be productive. We are averse to being idle. And so when we spend entire days with nothing to show for how we spent the hours of the days, it makes us feel unproductive. And that undermines our sense of purpose and lessens our satisfaction. So we become dissatisfied from that. And I think that's really important to recognize is that there is such thing as having too much discretionary time. Now, I will also note that if that discretionary time, because oftentimes people who don't work or who are retirees are like, well, <laughs> does that mean that I'm necessarily going to be unhappy because I have all this discretionary time? And the answer is no. The answer is if you actually spend your discretionary, at least some of your discretionary hours in ways that feel worthwhile. And by worthwhile, ways that you personally identify as feeling productive and worthwhile social connection is something that feels impactful. Retirees who do volunteer work, actually, you see that they're more satisfied than those who don't. Um, also within our data, even those who spent their discretionary hours on investing in hobbies that were personally enriching, then you actually didn't see this drop. So this is all actually going to, I think, a very important point that our happiness isn't so much about how much time we have to spend. It's really how we spend that time that we have. Um, and that is within happier hour. I have, There's exercises that I lead folks to walk through to identify for yourself what are those ways of spending that do feel worthwhile? Also, what are those ways of spending that are a waste so that you can allocate your time to maximize the worthwhile ways of spending, minimize the waste, and from that, feel happier. God willing. Yeah, we're working towards it. Uh, this is Dory Clark. We're here with uh, Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. Our guest this week is Cassie Holmes. You can check her out, learn more about her work. It's Cassie M. Holmes. Dot com. The new book is called 
happier hour. And we're talking about strategies to be happier. Please feel free to type your questions for Cassie into the chat box. And as you're doing that, we want to say hi to our amazing friends and loyal viewers from around the world. Patrice is in Santa Ana. Ryan is in Massachusetts. Anthony's in Virginia. We've got Alicia from Berkeley. We've got Sueli from Florida. Salisu is joining us again from Niger. Sean is in Calgary. Cheryl is in Nebraska. Richard's in the UK. Preeti is joining us. Uh, Susan is bringing, her, bringing us the coals from Newcastle. Khalid is here. Chie from Ohio. We've got Mohammed in Kurdistan. That's great. We've got Abul Fatai from New York. York City. We love having all of you. Uh, Syed from Pakistan and Harry from Sweden. Hello, everybody. And uh, we're thrilled that you are here. Now, Cassie, an important question here. We all know that there are some activities that we just we just have to do, right? We gotta we gotta do our taxes. We've gotta you know answer all the emails. You know all the things that are kind of a, a drag. And of course, we want to be smart about maximizing the opportunities for things that bring happiness. But inevitably, we have just some boring tasks that, you know, life demands that we do. What is your strategy for how we can get through them in the least offensive and obtrusive way? <laughs> yeah. So one of the strategies to um, make those chores or chore-like activities feel less like a chore um, is using a strategy called bundling. And so this is based off of work by Katie Milkman and colleagues. And the idea is so simple, but it, the effect is so major. Um, and basically for bundling, you bundle one of these activities that you don't like to do. And based off of the time tracking research, those activities tend to include household chores. So like folding the laundry, um, cleaning the kitchen. It also includes commuting. So time spent commuting, um, typically Americans experience as among the least happy because it feels like such a waste. You're just trying to get through it. But if you bundle this time with an activity that is enjoyable, like you know, listening to a podcast, like actually um, for all the Americans who commute by car, listening to an audiobook. So instead of scrolling mindlessly through um, the radio, or if you commute sitting on a train, scrolling mindlessly through your social media, if you're in, instead intentional with that activity and listen to an audiobook or read a book if you're sitting on the train, you know, when I have people answer or complete the statement, I don't have time to. One of the primary things that folks say they don't have time to do is to read for pleasure. If you spend that time reading or listening to books, you can actually get through um, books, a book every couple of weeks. Um, or, you know, like when you're folding the laundry, bundle it with something that you really do enjoy. So research also shows the wonderful happiness from social connection. So pick up the phone and call your friend who lives in one of these far off places that you guys are all <laughs> and talk to them. And all of a sudden bundling that social um, time with this unfun time um, makes uh, that time more worthwhile and more enjoyable. Those are some great points. I'm Dory Clark, and we're here with Cassie Holmes. She's the author of the book, Happier Hour. We want to say hi to Natalia. She's in Texas. We have uh, Asa Duzaman from Bangladesh. We have Eugenia from Costa Rica. We've got a LinkedIn friend from Myanmar. Welcome. Wendy's in New Jersey. Clara's in Paraguay. We've got Sunita from Dublin. We've got Sophia from the UK. We've got Kaman joining us. We have uh, Rita Marie joining us again from Ireland and Amy from Charlotte. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. We want to take your questions for Cassie Holmes, author of Happier Hour. And I wanted to uh, dig into this great question that came in from Alicia, Cassie. She wants to know, how do you recommend skill building for developing mastery in optimizing your use of discretionary time? Are, you know, is this a skill that we can you know, sort of build? And if so, how? Absolutely. It is a skill and it needs to be informed. So Happier Hour is full of exercises. And so I will also share that this is a book that's based off of my career of research on time and happiness, but also a course that I've been teaching uh, to our MBAs called Applying the Science of Happiness to Life Design, in which I give my students assignments so that they can apply these empirically based insights and experience the benefits immediately. 
in happier hour, I give you those exercises so that you can develop the skills, gain that knowledge and apply it. And, and once you see the effects, so also in each of these um, assignments and exercises, once you do it, there's a sort of part of reflecting back and like, how did that make me feel? <laughs> and most cases it's positive. Um, and so once you are applying the exercises, doing the exercises and reflecting back, it's like, oh, that actually had a significant impact on my well-being this week. I will do it again going forward. They're one of the really helpful exercises in terms of identifying what are those worthwhile ways of spending um, versus wasteful ways is actually time tracking for yourself. So over the course of one or two weeks, write down, and there's a um, worksheet that you can use that's on my website, which was already shared, cassiemholmes.com. And what you're doing is writing down for each half hour what you're doing, what the activity is, but more importantly, rating on a 10 point scale, how did that activity make you feel? How satisfied, fulfilling, enjoyable was it? So that at the end of the week, you have this amazing data set that you can look back and pull out, all right, what are those activities that got your highest ratings? What are those activities that got your lowest ratings? How much time are you spending across these various activities? And you might see, for instance, that, you know, what is that time sand? What are, what are those things that don't even get very high ratings from you? So they're not even enjoyable and maybe not even worthwhile. So when my students do this, they note the large amount of time that gets spent and in their words, wasted on social media, um, binge watching TV. So it's interesting when you see watching TV, that first half hour, first hour gets high ratings, but on hour four into it, you see the enjoyment ratings drop. So that's really helpful information because- Sort of like the fourth piece of cake, right? <laughs> absolutely. Um, and that is based off of hedonic adaptation. So we, as we are continually exposed to stimuli over time, we get used to it. It stops having as uh, intensive an effect on our emotional experience. So this is helpful, right? Because that suggests that A, have little bits of cake spread out through the week. B, for TV watching, have a, an hour that you're going to watch and then spread that out in the week. Um, and for social media is recognizing the impact of that on your emotional experience. And so you can assess, is this really worth my time? Um, and if not, then you can reallocate that time to other activities that are um, more fulfilling and worthwhile. Yeah, love that. We're here with Cassie Holmes. She's the author of the new book, Happier Hour. I'm Dory Clark. This is Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. And I want to double click on your recommendation, Cassie, about time tracking. This is something that I have done uh, numerous times myself and always learn a lot from it. Uh, if you, In fact, if you are watching this and you Google Dory Clark and time tracking, you'll see a couple of articles that I've written about that experience and lessons that I derived from it. Um, we have some great comments coming in uh, from folks. I love this. Marie uh, says, I, I used to use my commuting time to organize my day and to-do list. It was almost like visualizing my day. It was time so well spent. I build that time at my desk every morning to build my productivity. So that's a great tip, Marie. Thanks for sharing that. And for all of you, please feel free to type your own time management and happiness tips into the chat box. We want to see them and uh, and learn from them so we can all learn from each other. Um, so a, a question came in, Cassie, from Malin, who wants to just press a little bit on the social media question uh, yeah. about, you know, we, we sort of know, know intuitively that it can be like a crazy rabbit hole that we're you know, sinking down. Malin mentions that um, she was just reading that time spent on the internet uh, increased about 30% over the past five years in Germany, where she is. Uh, and, you know, that, that probably is a little bit uh, scary consequences. But can you talk a little bit more about the connection between social media usage and happiness? Yeah. And there is research that shows that um, it's really the way that you use social media that influences or determines whether it's a positive or negative effect. 
So as I mentioned before, social connection, this sense of having strong relationships that we cultivate and foster, this sense of belonging are really positive contributors to our happiness. And research shows that when people use social media to um, foster those existing connections and stay connected with the individuals in their lives, then it actually has a positive effect. Um, however, most people use social media passively and passive usage of social media has a negative effect um, and you can understand why. So when you are constantly watching other people's lives, what you are getting is just a sort of not representative sampling of other people's lives. It's the sort of happiest moments, most interesting moments where they are posting. Um, and so all you're doing is constantly seeing sort of all that you could and should be doing, and it increases a sense of FOMO. It also increases a sense of loneliness. So it has that counter effect on our feelings of social connection. It makes us feel lonely because so often when we are looking at our phones, then we are, <laughs> it's pulling us out, like we're sitting on the couch, or even if we're sitting across the table from someone, it's pulling us out of that experience um, and the opportunity for real connection. So the research shows that greater time spent passively on social media is associated with less happiness um, and increased uh, feelings of uh, loneliness, which is that contributor to unhappiness. And then also from the time perspective, that's where the time tracking comes into play. It maybe isn't so bad if you're getting sort of middling ratings, not getting, you're giving, because this is your time that you've spent um, on an activity that fills a lot of your time, that might be fine. But when you feel like you don't have the time to do these activities that are truly fulfilling, if you forfeit like, oh, I don't have time to meet up with my sister for dinner um, because I'm so busy, <laughs> but you're spending a dozen hours that week on social media, that, that's where you see um, another issue come into play. Yeah, really important point. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm Dory Clark. We're here with Cassie Holmes. She is the author of the new book, Happier Hour. And we're talking about how to be happier. We want to say hi to our amazing friends tuning in uh, this week and every week from around the world. We have a LinkedIn friend from Wanakee, Wisconsin. We have Molly from St. Louis, Richards in Yorkshire. Vanessa's in Las Vegas. Armando's in Salt Lake City. We've got a LinkedIn friend from New York. Sohail is in Pakistan. Danielle's from Brazil. Tazneem's in, in, in Egypt. Niskol is in India. Uh, Chamath is in Sri Lanka. And, uh, and many more friends Helen is from Queens uh, and Sean's in Toronto. We love having all of you guys. Please type your questions for Cassie Holmes into the chat box. And if you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like and share button so that we, you know, all your friends can benefit from this conversation and get a dose of happiness themselves. Now, Cassie, you, you're researching this. Obviously, uh, one hopes you were attempting to walk the talk. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal daily routines. Can you talk to us a little bit more about a day in the life of Cassie Holmes? and how you are op operationalizing some of the research about what you have learned with regard to happiness? Yes, and I absolutely live this. <laughs> I mean, it was motivated by my own issues, you know, and then I conduct me search to answer empirically the questions that I'm struggling with personally, and then I apply it. So day in the life of me based off of the findings, well, it starts with going outside for a morning run. So research shows that exercise is a significant mood booster. It offsets anxiety um, and it increases self-esteem. Uh, and when you do it outside, there's also interesting research that shows that simply being outside without a roof over your head increases happiness. Um, so I start going for a morning run. Uh, and also actually exercise is one of those things that we forfeit when we don't feel like we have enough time. But what time poverty part of it is driven by is this sense of not feeling confident that we can achieve all that we set out to do. When you start your day exercising, it increases that sense of self-efficacy. And so and as you bring on your day, it's like, oh, I can, I can do this. You feel less limited by time. And that is absolutely 
something that I make myself do, even when I don't feel that I have the time because coming out of it, it is every time worthwhile. So there's that. And then I do work that I absolutely find fulfilling. So in um, one of the exercises uh, in happier hour is the five whys. And what that exercise does is it Ask, it sort of leads you to identify why do you do what you do? And then your answer to that, why is that important? And as you dig into five layers down of whys, it really highlights what are those higher order goals that you have? What really drives you? And that's very informative for particularly your work hours. What projects, activities do you take on in pursuit of your own personal purpose. And also actually touching back to one of your previous questions as to how you make some of those tasks that you have to do feel a little more fun. Once you recognize how some of those chores fit in and serve your individual purpose, it all of a sudden makes them feel more worthwhile and less taxing while you're doing it. Also social connection. So my coffee dates uh, with my daughter. And so this is something that I do uh, each week and it is 30 minutes. So my daughter is seven years old. It started when she was um, three and we will go to the coffee shop and it is just time for she and me to be together. Phone goes away, no distractions, that to-do list that runs through the back of my head gets quieted. And so this is 30 minutes that I love and absolutely bring me great joy. And so when, and then you even see the effects of it carry outside of that 30 minutes, we have, I have that whole week of anticipating it and we sort of look forward to it and then reflecting back on it, um, which picks up on something that I mentioned before that is not so much about how much time you have or even how much time you spend on particular activities is really also how you engage in those activities when you're spending them. So, I mean, I could go on forever about all the ways that I live this stuff. And basically, unintentionally, when I wrote a happier hour, there's a lot of me in there because what I realized is that the data becomes much, feels much more resonant um, and uh, relevant when you pull in the personal stories. And so there's, I'm like, well, I do this and this is how it works. My students do this, this is how it works. Um, and so, yeah, in Happier Hour, you'll hear even more. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Again, the book is Happier Hour. We're here with Cassie Holmes. Uh, it's CassieMHolmes.com. And uh, this is Dory Clark. If you want to make sure you're never missing one of our weekly Newsweek interview shows, you can go to my website. You can go to DoryClark.com. Sign up. You'll download a free self-assessment. You will join the email list and you'll get reminders for shows and great uh, guests like Cassie. Uh, so we have time, Cassie, for probably just one more question before we jump into that. I want to make sure we're saying hi to our great friends tuning in. Lucy's in Connecticut. Angelina is in uh, New York. Uh, Sheikh Hanif is from uh, Georgetown, Guyana. We're glad you're here. Liz from St. Augustine. Lisa from Virginia. Patrick in Mississippi. And Cynthia uh, is from Paraguay way but living in the U.S. and Tomas is in Dublin. We love having every single one of you and a great question came in from uh, from our astute questioner Alicia. She's back with more. It's a great question Alicia. Thank you. She said it seems like we have to be disciplined. We have to be like Goldilocks here in terms of not too much, not too little. Um, can you talk a little bit Cassie about the role of discipline? when it comes to structuring our time and our activities for maximum happiness. A lot of people struggle with this. What's your quick tip? Yeah, being intentional. So once you've identified what are those worthwhile ways of spending, put those into your calendar first. Create the time, protect the time so that you will ensure that at the end of the week, you're not looking back and all the sand, all these things that filled your time unintentionally um, and so it absolutely does require discipline, but I would actually make it even easier than that. It's just intention. Amazing. Yes, we all have to be focused in order to be able to tap into the happiness that we all deserve. 
Thank you, Cassie Holmes, for joining us again. Learn more about Cassie and her work. Go to CassieMHolmes.com. Her new book, you can get it now, is called Happier Hour. And this is Dory Clark with our weekly Newsweek interview show. We'll be here next Thursday. It's every Thursday, noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, 5 o'clock in London. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And a special thank you to Cassie. We're so glad you joined us. Well, thanks for having me. This was fun. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week.